Uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak with you this morning. And uh, in light of what Rusty said, which I agree wholeheartedly with, I'm humbled uh, to be able to study God's word with you this morning. Uh, and I appreciate the invitation to do so from the Bible faculty and your kind attention and interest in this topic uh, that you've shown uh, in being here. We're going to be discussing a short passage in this hour uh, that is found only in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew chapter 17 and verses 24 through 27. And although we've got a lot to cover uh, in this uh, short time, it's a short enough passage that it seems wrong not to start by simply reading it. Uh, so Matthew chapter 17 and verses 24 through 27. It says, when they had come to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? And he said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he had said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. This is an odd passage for a number of reasons. First of all, if you're just reading through the Gospel of Matthew, it's not readily apparent how this fits into the context at all. In fact, with some of my colleagues at HST, you know, they asked what I would be speaking on. I told them this parable and, and to a man. Every one of them said, oh, that's so random. That's such a random story. It's just really difficult to tell how this fits into the context in the flow of Matthew. And what's more, the story doesn't fit into the normal categories that are used to describe gospel pericopes. Um, it is a miracle story, and yet if you look closely, the miracle itself is not narrated. Um, Jesus tells Peter to go out and do this, but Matthew does not say, as we would expect him to, and Peter arose and went and cast the line into the sea and so forth. It's a miracle story without the miracle. Someone might say, well, it's a conflict story, like so many where Jesus uh, has these people come to him with questions, and yet where's the conflict? The collectors come and say, does he pay the tax? And Peter says, yes, and they say, oh, oh okay. There's no conflict. Uh, now there's conflict with Peter uh, in uh, Peter or, or Jesus correcting Peter, and yet at the end of the story, Jesus pays the tax anyway. It's a conflict story without a conflict, a miracle story without a miracle. And so the, the story just doesn't fit into the normal pigeonholes that form critical scholars typically put gospel pericopes in. And what's more, when we begin to look at this passage in detail, all sorts of questions arise that can dramatically change our interpretation of the text. What is the two drachma tax? Uh, why are they asking this question? Who are the sons? What does Jesus mean by giving offense? And above all, why on earth must the coin come from the mouth of a fish? Our answers to those questions will dramatically change our interpretation. And so this can be a difficult passage. One scholar said that this passage is one of the most difficult in the gospel to understand, both in terms of the significance of certain details and in light of its location in the context. The most difficult in the gospel. So, of course, it's the one that I get to assi get assigned uh, to, to give a lecture on. That's okay. Challenge accepted. Uh, we'll try to work through this text. And what I want to do is I've, I've sort of narrowed it down to four critical questions that we need to answer to be able to give an interpretation of this text. And I want us to examine those together. And you might come to different conclusions about those questions than I do. But I think they're necessary to look at in detail uh, before we look at the text as a whole. And I'll warn you, we're going to spend a lot of time on the first two and not, a, not as much time on the, the second two. But when we've done that, we'll back up and just sort of summarize the text, given the conclusions that I at least have come to, uh, and see what this text is talking about. And then finally, I want to focus on one particular aspect of the gospel uh, that, touches, that this passage touches on. So our first critical question, anytime we are studying a text, we ought to make an effort to understand the cultural and the historical background in which that text was written. And that is especially true for our first key question, and that is, what is the didrachma? 
The English Standard Version supplies the word tax here, but in the Greek, uh, it identifies those uh, who come to Peter simply as the collectors of the didrachma. And their question is, does your teacher not pay the didrachma? So the first thing we've got to figure out is what in the world is the didrachma? And unfortunately, there's a little math here involved. I'm sorry. Anybody that knows me knows I'm the last person to throw math at you, but uh, here we go. A drachma was roughly equivalent to the wages that a laborer might expect for a day's work. And if you take four drachma, you get a stator. Uh, and if you take half of a stator, then obviously that's two drachma. Well, they had a coin for that, the did drachma. The di is just the prefix meaning two. And it gets a little bit more complicated here, but I'll simplify it. One stator is equal to one shekel. So if you want a half of a shekel, you're looking for two drachmas. You're looking for one did drachma. So a did drachma is a half shekel. And obviously there's some sort of did drachma tax being collected here. And so we need to ask, well, what, what tax is this? And there are basically two options. First, some have understood this as a secular tax imposed by the Romans. And if we understand it that way, then this passage is one of several passages that talks about taxation in general. And that was actually a popular way to read this passage uh, in the centuries following the destruction of the temple, the patristic uh, era. Uh, a small minority of scholars still argue that this is simply a Roman tax uh, of the amount of a didrachma. The problem with that is that we don't know of any didrachma tax from the Romans imposed in Palestine at this time. I believe the closest, if I recall correctly, is the first century BC in Egypt. But we just don't know of any tax that would fit the bill here. And that's why the vast majority of modern scholars understand this didrachma as a reference to the temple tax, which is also known as the half shekel tax. And if you'll remember the math lesson, a half shekel tax would be a didrachma tax. Now, this was basically an annual collection to take care of the needs of the temple. Every adult male Jew was expected to contribute half a shekel for the purposes of funding the temple activities, these daily sacrifices and so on. And by the time of Jesus, the temple tax, as far as I can tell, is not a tax that's being enforced by law. And so it's not, maybe we should put quotation marks around the word tax. When the Romans came along, uh, whether it was enforced by law before or not, I don't know. But when the Romans came along, uh, they got to enforce what taxes uh, were implemented. But because the Jews had been there for the Romans in a few key moments, uh, they generously allowed the Jews to continue this practice of sending money to the Jerusalem temple every year. And this was a, a privilege that the Jews were quite proud of and that they had to fight for uh, at different times. Um, Unfortunately, after the destruction of Jerusalem, the Romans do enforce this tax, but the money doesn't go to the Jerusalem temple. It goes to the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus in Rome and the Fiscus Judaicus. But before the destruction of the temple, the, I don't believe the Romans were enforcing this tax. There was no Jewish IRS that would kick your door down if you didn't pay. The pressure to pay was social and patriotic. This tax was seen as a statement of solidarity with Jerusalem and with the worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem. It was a popular tax, therefore. They were glad to pay this tax, especially in the diaspora. Josephus, when he's talking about the temple in Jerusalem and explaining how it could possibly have this enormous wealth, uh, says all the Jews throughout the habitable world and those who worship God, even those from Asia and Europe, have been contributing to it for a very long time. Every year, more and more money going to the temple in Jerusalem. A little before Josephus, Philo says that practically in every city there are banking places for the holy money where people regularly come and give their offerings. And he goes on to say that that money is then sent to Jerusalem by specially appointed envoys uh, who are sent away uh, with joy. Elsewhere, Philo claims that the Jews pay this tribute gladly and cheerfully. And I love this. He says, with a zeal and readiness which needs no prompting and an ardor which no words can describe. Can you imagine anybody being that thick and flowery about the taxes that you and I pay? Um, he's saying that they are happy to pay this tax. This is a popular tax. In the writings of Cicero, uh, we find an allusion to, to this practice. Uh, he is defending a man named Flaccus who had been a governor in Asia 
And while he was governor, he tried to prevent the Jews from sending their money to Jerusalem, and it caused uh, quite an uproar. And then finally, we have lots of discussion about the temple tax in rabbinical sources, uh, often giving details about how and when and from whom this tax was collected, although I would give a word of caution that the details from those rabbinical sources should be taken with a grain of salt, uh, as those sources are much later uh, than the first century. And I would also add, uh, based on my observation and reading commentaries in preparation for this, there are a lot of commentators who just uncritically accept uh, what the rabbinical sources say, uh, and we should be wary of that. But they contribute to a picture of the temple tax as a very popular expression of patriotic solidarity with Jerusalem, especially in the diaspora, every year, sending money to the temple uh, there in Jerusalem. And we might wonder, where in the world did this tax come from? It's sort of like the synagogue, you know, you're reading the Old Testament, you've got temple, temple, then the temple gets destroyed, and then you've got this, you know, era of silence, and all of a sudden it's synagogue, 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 and you wonder, where, where did the synagogues come from? Well, the origins of those is pretty hazy, too. Uh, but it's much like that. The origin of the temple tax is a little bit hazy. Uh, the form of the tax that is around in Jesus' day appears to have originated in the Maccabean era, specifically in the period when the Pharisees enjoyed a lot more political power. Now, in the time of Jesus, the Pharisees enjoyed a lot of social power, but there had been a time, specifically during the reign of Alexandra, when the Pharisees, uh, they, they dabbled in politics, as it were. And uh, it really... Uh, uh, wielded some power during that time. And it's thought that they found biblical prince, uh, precedent uh, for this tax in Exodus 30 and verses 11 through 16, which we're not going to read for the sake of time, but I'll paraphrase. Uh, they, on that occasion, it is a, a census that is being taken. If you know anything about the Old Testament, if you're going to take a census, you're going to be liable to the wrath of God. And so in Exodus 30 and verses 11 through 16, we find instructions for them to pay a half shekel ransom uh, in order to, uh, to uh, offset this census that they're going to be taking. And it says that the proceeds are then going to be used for the service of the tent of meeting. And if you flip over um, to Exodus 38 and verses 25 through 28, what you find is, what they mean by that, is that this money was used uh, to, to purchase and to make things like the ladles and the bowls and uh, the cultic items that they would need uh, in the tabernacle and ultimately in the temple. And the originators of the temple tax argued, well, we still have the temple. It still, needs, uh, it still has financial needs. And so this temple tax, this half shekel annual compulsory temple tax, is just a continuation of God's command in Exodus 30, and therefore binding on all of Israel. But we might well ask, is that really what Exodus 30 is saying, is God really implementing an annual compulsory tax in Exodus 30? And we wouldn't be alone in asking that. Because the temple tax, as popular as it was in the time of Jesus, was also one, we have strong evidence that there were some groups who questioned the legitimacy of it. They questioned whether it was truly a tax uh, from God. Uh, for example, the priests, and here I think we're talking largely about the Sadducees, evidently refused to pay the tax. In the Mishnah, the Mishnah recalls that the priests were not to be taxed, quote, for the sake of peace. It's one of those phrases that you know there's a story behind. You know, we wish we, wish we had a story like slap fighting in the temple, I don't know. Uh, but for the sake of peace, they were not to collect the tax from uh, the priests. Again, I think probably talking about the Sadducees there. And the text goes on to imply that they didn't want to pay the tax because they were just greedy. They just didn't want to give up their money. A much later text uh, in the Talmud suggests that really the reason that the Sadducees opposed the tax was not so much greed, but because they believed that the temple should be funded by voluntary offerings uh, rather than mandatory taxes. And if that is the reason for their objection, they would be in line with much of Old Testament history in which we find the temple being funded by voluntary offerings, especially offerings from the royal house of David. So we have the Sadducees who refuse to pay the tax, and then we have these weird people down in Qumran. I had the opportunity to visit Qumran this past summer. Uh, it was a great opportunity, oh, a beautiful area, a kind of rugged beauty. Uh, and I told, I told Jared earlier this week that the one thing I miss, well, it's not the one thing I miss, but 
the thing I miss the most about Israel is the stillness of the desert around the Dead Sea. There's just something about it. Beautiful area, not a place I would want to live. But there was a whole community who lived down by the Dead Sea at Qumran. And these people, I think it's fair to say, despised both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, they were not fans of either. And so what are they going to do with this temple tax? Well, thankfully, we have the answer in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scroll says, Concerning the ransom, the money of valuation which one gives as a ransom for his own person will be half a shekel. Only once will he give it in all his days. So we have an interesting little compromise here. On the one hand, they seem to acknowledge that it's legitimate to take Exodus 30 that way. Notice they call it a ransom. That's language right out of Exodus 30. But on the other hand, they do not accept that it is a mandatory annual compulsory tax. We'll pay it once, they say. So you have these minority groups who, even though the tax is popular and it's this statement of patriotic solidarity, you have these minority groups who question the legitimacy of this tax. And that brings us back to Matthew chapter 17. What are the collectors asking when they approach Peter? And we might even ask, why are they approaching Peter in the first place? I would submit to you that they are not asking whether Jesus personally claims some sort of exemption from paying taxes, nor do I think they are attempting to trap Jesus as his questioners so often are. Rather, I think they are asking a perfectly reasonable question given the background that we've just talked about. Is Jesus someone who accepts the, le the legitimacy of the tax and pays the tax like most Jews? Or, and you can forgive them for thinking that he might be, or is he one of these minority groups these weirdos who, for one reason or another, objects to the leg legitimacy of the tax and either refuses to pay it or maybe pays it once in a lifetime or some other compromised position. They ask the question in the Greek anticipating a positive response. And again, that's reasonable. Most people paid the tax. And it's reasonable that they would assume that Jesus did. And Peter evidently assumes that Jesus would in his uh, hasty yes. And yet the fact that they asked the question betrays the fact uh, that they suspected that there would at least be a chance that Jesus would not, that he would object. And it turns out Jesus does have an objection to the tax. Peter just doesn't know about it yet. And that leads us to the second critical question we must ask of this text, and that is who are the sons that Jesus talks about? He expresses his objection to the temple tax by means of an analogy. Uh, kings do not tax their own sons. The sons are free from that burden. And the same is true for the king of heaven. The analogy itself is pretty straightforward. The problem is our interpretation of that analogy, analogy is going to change drastically depending on how we understand sons in the analogy. First of all, there's the sons of the earthly king. And who are they? Uh, some have suggested that what Jesus is referring to is not physical sons, but rather servants of the king, high government officials. And the point, therefore, would be that Jesus is doing the work of the Father, and therefore he is exempt from paying taxes. If you're a full-time minister, that's the position you want to argue for. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't hold up. Uh, there's, there's little evidence that the word sons uh, was used uh, in that way in Jesus' time. Others say, well, it's talking about citizenship. The sons of the king are the citizens of the kingdom, and the others are non-citizens. And I even found several places in, in a couple of otherwise good commentaries where it just states plainly, kings do not tax their own citizens, they tax non-citizens. What? Uh, that is not true. Kings, both today and in ancient times, tax their own citizens all the time. Uh, so that doesn't hold up uh, either. I think the best way of understanding this is is the most straightforward and simple, that he's talking about their literal sons, the royal family. They don't have to pay taxes because they're family. They're the sons and the daughters of the king. But the more important question is, who are the sons of the heavenly king that Jesus is talking about here? About whom is he speaking when he says the sons are free? And how does this relate to the temple tax? There are three views uh, that I want to share with you uh, regarding that. The first view is that Jesus 
is referring to his own divine sonship. So the argument would go like this. Jesus is the divine son of God, and therefore he is exempt from paying taxes to the Father. Um, and this has some strength, this, this view. First of all, the divine sonship of Jesus is a thread in the Gospel of Matthew that's been there all along, and this would be a continuation of that theme. But I think even more importantly, this view would connect this passage with the transfiguration earlier in the chapter, which obviously emphasizes the unique divine sonship of Jesus. And as we mentioned at the beginning, it's hard to find connections with the context, so when you've got one, that's a strength for your argument. But I would also suggest that there are some weaknesses to this argument, and in, in my judgment, uh, weaknesses that are ultimately fatal to it. First of all, Jesus uses the plural sons here, both in the analogy and in the application. Why, if he is referring to his unique divine sonship, doesn't he just use the singular? I mean, if you replace the plural with the singular, it makes sense. Uh, there's no reason that he has to use the plural. Why not use the singular if he is referring to his divine sonship, especially given that he is obviously the only divine son of God? Which leads us to a second weakness. In Matthew, uh, or I'm sorry, in verse 27, it seems to imply, most commentators understand it to imply, that whatever sonship Jesus is talking about, Peter shares in that sonship. And therefore, uh, they pay or don't pay uh, together. And, G and Peter, uh, Peter was a lot of things, but he was not the divine son of God. He could not share uh, in that. And I would also point out a third thing, and that is that this view that Jesus is talking about, his divine sonship, that view assumes that the tax is really the father's tax in the first place. And I would argue that that's assuming the answer to the, the very question at hand. In my judgment, this first view is the weakest of the three. Uh, though, if you pick up a commentary, there's a good chance that you will find a commentator uh, who is wrestling with how this can be the divine sonship uh, that is in view here. By far the most common interpretation, however, is the second view, and that is that the sons are the disciples of Jesus who are enjoying a unique relationship as sons and daughters of the Father. Those who follow Jesus are children of God, and children of God in a unique way that no one else, including the Jews, uh, could claim. Jesus and his disciples, therefore, are exempt from the temple tax, um, because they are claiming this unique privilege based on their relationship with the Father. This also has some strengths. First of all, the disciples of Christ are uniquely the children of God, as other New Testament te texts teach. John 1, verses 11 through 13, Galatians 3, Romans 9, uh, and many other passages. There is a unique relationship that the disciples of Jesus have with God, that we can call ourselves the children of God. And that relationship certainly comes with privileges that are not enjoyed by others. So this is a view that is held by the majority of commentators. If you pick up a commentary, you're almost certainly going to see this view uh, uh, being expressed. And I believe it is far stronger than the first view. However, there is a weakness here that causes me to pause and wonder if maybe there is something else going on here. And that is that the unique sonship of the disciples of Jesus, while a teaching fleshed out in the New Testament, is not something that has been taught in Matthew up to this point. Up to this point in Matthew's gospel, there's been lots of occasions when Jesus has, has talked about God as father and said, your father this and your father that. But if you look closely, that's often done in public settings where he's talking to mixed crowds of his disciples and other Jews. If then this is the first place where Matthew introduces this doctrine, it seems an awful subtle way of introducing such a glorious doctrine. And we may well ask, is it reasonable to expect the reader of Matthew, who's been seeing all these references to God as the father of the Jews in general, for them to pick up on this sudden change of meaning uh, here in Matthew chapter 17? And again, I would notice, uh, I take note of the fact that this view assumes that the temple tax really is the father's tax. They're just exempt because they're disciples of Jesus. Again, assuming the answer to the question that I think is, is at hand here. And that leaves, for me at least, the door open to a third possibility. 
And I'll tell you ahead of time, this is a minority view, and you might not agree with it. That's fine. Uh, I lean toward it, obviously. And that is this view that the sons of the kingdom of heaven, or the king of heaven here in Jesus' analogy, are the people of Israel in general. In this view, Jesus is not claiming a personal exemption, nor is he trying to extend some unique privileges uh, to his disciples, his followers. Rather, Jesus is showing that the rationale that was used to justify the temple tax has been faulty all along. He is, in other words, denying that the temple tax is really from the Father. And how does he know this? Because God does not treat the people of Israel as if they are his subjects whom he exacts a tribute from. He treats them like a father treats sons and daughters. The sons are free from such burdens, and therefore this burden, the temple tax, cannot legitimately be from the father. It cannot be a legitimate tax. And I think this argument has some strengths. For one thing, it is in keeping with the background that we discussed a moment ago, in which some groups objected to the legitimacy of the tax and the rationale that had been used to justify it. Jesus, then, is among those who object to the tax. And again, it was seen that the collectors of the tax suspected that he might be, or they wouldn't have asked the question in the first place. And secondly, the concept of the people of Israel as children of God is something that has been found in Matthew's gospel up to this point. And in fact, it's found all over the place in Matthew's gospel. Jesus frequently refers to God as the father of the Jews uh, who he is addressing. The Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is ostensibly delivered to his disciples, and yet we know there was a great crowd there, uh, refers to your father 11 times. Jesus has frequently referred to God as the father of the people of Israel in the Gospel of Matthew, and so this is in keeping with that thread. This is in no way to take away from the unique relationship that Jesus' disciples have as children of God. Don't misunderstand me. But there's also a sense in which all the people of Israel are sons and daughters of the king of heaven. And Jesus uses that relationship to demonstrate why he objects to a compulsory annual temple tax, some sort of tribute that has to be paid uh, to, to a tyrant. Now again, I, I don't find that first view very compelling, that Jesus is talking about his divine sonship. And I think a good case can be made for the second view, uh, and I think a good case can be made for the third view. I lean toward the third view. You may disagree and may need to study it some more, uh, but it seems to make sense uh, to me. That brings us to the third critical question. Again, we're going to spend less time on the third and the fourth uh, so that we have time uh, to, uh, to fit some things in here at the end. The third qu critical question that we need to understand in order to interpret this passage is why does Jesus pay it anyway if he has objections to it? And who is it that he's talking about when he says that they might get offended? He has objections to the tax, but he decides to pay it so as not to give offense to them. The Greek word that's translated to give offense here is skandalizo. And when I learned that in first year Greek, I learned that the meaning was to cause someone to sin. And as a result of that basic definition of skandalizo, a lot of people have just bent themselves all sort of out of shape trying to figure out who is going to be caused to sin if Jesus doesn't pay the tax here. It seems to me, though, that that ignores the, facts that, the fact that words have multiple meanings. And in fact, in Matthew, the word scandalizo has multiple meanings. There are some contexts in which it seems to take on more of a meaning of to shock, to give offense, to give somebody a cause to be angry at you. And it seems to me that much more likely that this is how the word is being used here. Jesus agrees to pay the tax over his objections because he does not want to give offense to someone. But who? Well, many have suggested that what Jesus is doing here is he's trying to avoid taking an unpopular position and causing public shock. Again, the majority of Jews paid this tax and were fervently paying this tax. They were proud uh, to pay this tax. Is Jesus then trying to avoid scandal by paying the tax, even though he has objections to it. That seems pretty unlikely to me. Uh, Jesus doesn't strike me as someone who is afraid of causing public scandal or even losing disciples uh, because of the positions that he takes. So I don't think that's the answer here. Many other suggestions have been made. I'm just going to tell you 
where I come down on it, although I do so with a little hesitation. Uh, anytime your solution to a passage is one that you can't find in any commentary, you're either a genius exegetically or probably wrong. And so I'm going to tell you, I haven't found this stated this way in any commentary, so take it with a grain of salt. And yet it seems obvious to me almost. Uh, it seems to me the simplest ex explanation is that Peter, unaware of Jesus' objections, has just committed them to pay the tax. What are they going to do now? Not pay it? Uh, that would give offense to the tax collectors to whom Peter has just made this commitment. Um, I may be wrong. I don't know why the other commentators don't say it like that. Uh, but that seems to me to be uh, what is going on here. Jesus has strong opinions about this tax and whether he should have to pay it. But in this case, he sets those opinions aside in order to keep from giving offense to others. And may I just note in passing, that's an attitude we should be uh, uh, imitating uh, in this time of tribalism and uh, offensiveness. And that leads us to the fourth critical question. This is the good one, right? What in the world is up with this fish? <laughs> Verse 27 is weird. It is weird. It is strange to me that they don't just pay the tax out of their common funds. We know they have a treasury. We know they have a money bag. Why not loosen the strings on it, reach your hand in there, grab the coins and pay it? Why does the coin have to come from a fish? It's just strange that Peter is commanded uh, to go and find this coin in a fish. And we've already noted in our introduction that uh, it is strange uh, that Matthew does not account or, or, or recount for us, as we would expect him to, that Peter goes out and does what he's instructed to do. Peter doesn't tell us about the miracle itself. He doesn't seem interested in it. Strange. And these kinds of oddities have led many, including many very conservative scholars, to wonder if maybe there isn't something going on here that we're missing. Something that the original readers would have picked up on immediately that, that we in our modern context just have trouble seeing. And the common suggestion is that maybe Jesus is not serious when he says this to Peter. That Jesus might have been making a humorous allusion to a common story element of finding a valuable in a fish as a way of kind of ribbing Peter a little bit. And that's essence saying, now that you've committed us to pay this tax, Peter, that I have objections to, you better go out there and catch that fish that we're always hearing about uh, so that we can pay it. And in support of this, scholars have often pointed out that this, this trope of finding a valuable in a fish that has been caught uh, is is common in pagan and Jewish literature, and it hurts me deeply inside that we don't have time for me to read you the story of Joseph, the Sabbath lover, uh, from uh, the rabbinical writings. It is in the written lecture. I encourage you to read that. I don't know why I like it so much. It's just short and pithy. But it's a, it is one of many examples of stories where somebody goes out and catches a fish, and it's got something valuable in it that changes uh, the story. And these stories are, are fairly common, and they have similarities with Matthew. There's no getting around that. However, there are also pretty big differences, and I don't know of any exact parallel to what we find here in Matthew. And my conclusion would be that in order to conclude that Jesus is jokingly talking to Peter here and that he should not be taken seriously, we would need to have a whole lot more information about what stories were circulating, how widely they were circulating, and with what nuances of humor uh, they were received. And that's simply information that I don't think we have. And so I personally don't feel comfortable taking Jesus as just unserious uh, on this occasion. In my judgment, it's best to take him uh, as sincerely expecting Peter to go out and do this to provide for this tax. Still leaves us with the question, though, why are we not told about the miracle itself? And I would simply suggest that Matthew skips the narration of the miracle itself because it would add nothing to the lesson that's taught by the pericope. You see, Matthew 17, verses 24 through 27 is not primarily about a really cool miracle of finding a coin in a fish's mouth. It is about God's relationship to his people. God's paternal relationship with his people is such that not only does he not burden his people with uh, some sort of annual tribute, but also he provides for his people, sometimes in the most miraculous ways. 
And that lesson is demonstrated by the analogy that Jesus gives and by the instructions that Jesus gives to Peter. Telling the story of the miracle itself, while it would be pretty cool, would really add nothing to the lesson. The lesson is what Matthew is concerned about on this occasion. So those are our four critical questions. Now let's back up for a moment. And again, you might not agree with some of the conclusions I've come to on this, but let's, let's just back up and sort of summarize what's going on in this passage given some of the things that we've talked about. In a time when most Jews proudly paid an annual temple tax of a didrachma, and yet also in a time when some minority groups refused to pay based on objections to the legitimacy of the tax, the collectors of the didrachma approach Peter and they say, Jesus pays the didrachma, right? And Peter says, yeah, of course he does. Sure. And then Peter goes inside and is educated. Uh, he is confronted by Jesus, who it turns out does have an objection to the tax. And in order to demonstrate his objection, Jesus uses the analogy of an earthly king. The king does not demand tribute from his own sons. The sons are free in that regard. And the same is true of the heavenly king. That is, the heavenly king does not demand a compulsory annual tribute to fund the temple, which is to say the temple tax is an illegitimate reading of Exodus 30. Nevertheless, there is nothing wrong with sending money to the temple voluntarily. And since Peter has just committed them to doing so, Jesus arranges to pay the tax in order not to give offense to the collectors. And so he arranges, moreover, for the coin to be a further demonstration that not only does the Father not burden his people, he provides for his people. And then having used this story to draw attention to the familial relationship of God and his people, Matthew has prepared the way for chapter 18's discussion of the proper attitudes that are to be had among God's people. Now, at this point in the lecture book, I discuss how this text might be read in various contexts, and I try to reflect in a general way about what this text tells us about Jesus. We simply don't have time uh, to do that this morning. Instead, what I want us to do is focus on one particular aspect of this study that seems to be to me, to be the most important. And that is the relationship between Jesus and Israel and between Israel and ourselves. You see, while I was studying this passage, I caught myself approaching it with a negative or dismissive view of Israel. And that's something I've been trying to work on in my Bible study in recent years. It seems strange to me that Jesus would concern himself with an in-house dispute about a temple tax. Far more appealing to me was the view that Jesus was thinking about the church, thinking about his people, rather than thinking about Israel. And it seems to me that too often Christians have approached the relationship between Jesus and Israel something like this. God arbitrarily chose Abraham's family uh, for the promises, and so Jesus had to be born a Jew. The Jews, we're told in the Old Testament, were pretty terrible, but God in his patience is able to get them just holy enough that he can sort of sneak the Christ into the world. And that once the Christ comes, Israel rejects and murders the Christ, not by themselves with the Romans' help, obviously. But they reject and murder the Christ, serving as sort of useful idiots in the plan of God. But that once that is done, they've more or less played their part. And the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Now there are obviously gentler ways of wording that. But it seems to me that's a pretty common uh, approach to Israel and Jesus' relationship to Israel. And it is absolutely contrary to the teaching of the Bible. Rather, the New Testament shows us that the ongoing relationship between Jesus, the Messiah, and his people, Israel, is central to the gospel message and continues to be central to the gospel message. Jesus is the promised restorer and redeemer of Israel. And when we lose sight of that, when we adopt a negative or dismissive view of Israel, we inevitably are going to misread parts of the New Testament, be they pericopes in the Gospels or elsewhere. Let me take for a moment and, and use Acts as an example. Sometimes the book of Acts is read as though it teaches that the Gospel was preached to Israel and Israel rejected it and therefore the Gospel was taken to the Gentiles instead. That is not what Luke is telling us in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we find this really neat 
geographical outline. You know this, right? Uh, that they are to be witnesses in Jerusalem and then Judea and then Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And lots of commentators have pointed out that Luke sort of follows that outline as the book of Acts plays out. But remember that verse 8 is spoken in response to the disciples' inquiry in verse 6. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And oh boy, do I have a soapbox on that that I don't have time to get up on. That is not a question that the disciples ask in ignorance. In verse 5, Jesus said that the, the Spirit would be outpoured on them. And the disciples know from the Old Testament that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was associated with the restoration of Israel. They're asking a perfectly legitimate question there. And in fact, in verses 7 through 8, Jesus corrects their interest in the timing of it, but he more or less affirms, yes, they are about to see the restoration of Israel happen. The Spirit is going to be poured out, and the gospel is going to be preached, first in Jerusalem and then in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I would submit to you that if you read Acts with eyes to see it, you will see that that is exactly what Luke is telling us in the book of Acts, especially in the early part of the book, the book of Acts, where over and over again the gospel is proclaimed to Israel, and Israel obeys in hordes, 3,000 on the very first sermon. Somebody might say, well, there were probably a million people in Jerusalem at the time. Okay, the prophets always said it would be a remnant. But what Luke is showing us, and in the following chapters, whole villages are obeying the gospel. The Samaritans, who aren't even full Jews, are obeying the gospel in hordes. What Luke is telling us is not Israel rejects the gospel, it's the opposite. We are seeing Israel be restored and redeemed by the blood of Christ. I would submit to you, even in the latter part of the book of Acts, Paul doesn't take the gospel first to the synagogues because he enjoys being persecuted or because he just kind of feels obligated to go to his own people first. He takes the gospel first to the synagogues because every time he does so, some, and sometimes many, who are of true Israel are restored and redeemed by Christ. A separation has to take place, yes, between those who will believe and be part of the remnant and those who won't. But what we're seeing is not the rejection of the gospel from Israel. It is the acceptance and the restoration of Israel by the blood of Christ. Then the gospel is taken to the Gentiles. It's a theme over and over and over again in the book of, of Acts. The book of Acts is telling the story of the restoration and redemption of Israel. But if we have adopted a negative and dismissive view of Israel, we can read Acts a hundred times and not see it. We can read past it uh, every time. Jesus is the promised restorer and redeemer of Israel, and that is a core part of the gospel message. If we don't grasp that relationship between Jesus and Israel, then we are going to miss the significance of many passages, perhaps even including uh, the coin in the fish's mouth. And I would also say that if we develop a negative and dismissive concept of Israel that ignores its importance in the gospel, we inevitably, inevitably are going to fail to grasp our own significance or the significance of our own relationship with Israel. I'm currently enrolled in a class on the Apostolic Fathers. In fact, I'm missing the class right now to deliver this lecture. Um, it's just a survey class. I'm not going to be a patristics expert like Bill Beck. Uh, and I'm just, it's the beginning of the semester, I've just barely dipped my toe into the Apostolic Fathers, these Christians who wrote shortly after the death of the Apostles. But one element of their writing that jumps out to me immediately is that they were keenly aware that they had been pagans, that they had nothing to look forward to but darkness and death, that they had been excluded from God's people but by the, God, the grace of God and the blood of Jesus. That's how they were able to call themselves children of God. They felt that. And it would be easy for me to lose sight of the fact that I, too, am a child of God only by God's grace. I was raised in the church. I'm a fourth-generation preacher. Uh, before she died, my great-grandmother on my mother's side told me I'm a seventh-generation member of the Church of Christ on her side. woo -hoo. It would be easy for me to take it for granted that I can be part of God's people. Not so for the early Christians. They keenly felt, they keenly understood what had, had, what had to happen in order for them to be called children of God. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 12 through 13 says, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, 
alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. They were God's people. And they could be called children of God only because by the blood of Christ, they had been joined to the commonwealth of Israel. And that brings us back to Matthew chapter 17. Why would Matthew include a story in which Jesus talks about the relationship between God and Israel? I mean, Matthew's gospel is for Christians, right? I would submit to you that maybe by asking the question, we are betraying the fact that we have adopted an unbiblical, dismissive view of Israel, a view of Israel that sees Israel as a kind of vestigial organ of God's plan, rather than the restored, glorified, central part of the gospel that it is. Matthew includes this story because we need to know and be reassured that God is not a tyrant over his people who demands tribute, but is a father who provides. He includes this story because whether we are of Jewish or Gentile descent, the blood of Christ has made us part of the true, restored, redeemed Israel. We are sons of Abraham. We are daughters of Israel. We are children of the King of Heaven. And praise be to God, the sons are free. Thank you for your attention.